and Dr. Ana Castillo. Uh, Dr. Lionel Brosi, uh, they, will, they will help today webinar called uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence in Social Sciences. Dr. Lionel Brosi is a professor and director of international affairs at the Institute of Communication and Image of the Uni University of Chile. He's also a director of the Artificial Intelligence and Society Hub and, and a faculty associate at the Bergmar Klein Center at Harvard University. He's working close, cl in close collaboration with the youth and media team and supporting ongoing effort of research and application of the field of artificial intelligence and inclusion and the study of the intersection of youth and digital technologies. Dr. Ana Castillo is a professor, at also, she's also a professor at the Institute of Communication and Image of the University of Chile. She's also the director of the Artificial Intelligence and Society Hub, and she's working on several research and application projects in the fields of art artificial intelligence and education, youth and digital technologies, and the future of work. She actively participates in consultancies and research with regional and international organizations on the intersection of youth, digital technologies, and human rights. Uh, so uh, we uh, both Professor uh, Brosi and Professor Castillo will give a lecture and at the end they will Q&A uh, any question you have. The webinar will last 50, 50 minutes. So I will, I will uh, be in charge of the chat. My name is Osvaldo, so let me introduce and uh, pass the word to Professor Lionel and Professor Castillo. Thank you. Thank you, Osvaldo. Thank you all for being here and thank you for having us. Uh, We're delighted to be sharing with you some of our research and points addressing the, the main theme. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen, my screen now, so I give you Lionel. Okay, so Anna, are you going to share the presentation? Okay, thank you all um, for having us and for, for participating. Um, as Osvaldo rightly mentioned, we are directing right now um, a research hub that is called Artificial Intelligence and Society, in which we do a lot of research and application on how um, artificial intelligence is impacting different areas uh, in our lives. So what we are going to show you now is, um, firstly, maybe Anna, you can tell the, the first topics that we are going to approach and then we start right away. Well, this um, is the main topic. We are, we are talking about artificial intelligence and social science um, from the approach that Lionel just mentioned, but we wanted to address uh, what is this webinar about in a few words. First of all, we're going to share with you a general understanding of where we stand and where we uh, put ourselves. Um, but in, uh, in relation to two main topics within the social sciences, there are uh, artificial intelligence and communication, artificial intelligence and ethics. And in the second part of the webinar, we're uh, expecting to share with you a methodological perspective on artificial intelligence and, and youth and uh, some research insights on AI and youth as well from all of the ongoing projects for the, uh, of the hub, of the Artificial Intelligence and Society hub. So maybe we could start right away by defining um, how or what we understand by artificial intelligence. There we are. So um, the concept of artificial intelligence may be Many of you are engineers or studying engineering um, and has a, a lot of, and you, you know that artificial intelligence has a lot of different approaches. Um, but here, for the purpose of this webinar, 
that it's intended to the general public, we are positioning artificial intelligence as a kind of intelligence, and I said it into quotes, demonstrated by machines in contrast to the natural or human intelligence um, show not only by, by humans, but also by animals. So AI, as currently we know it, um, includes tasks such as planning, understanding language, recognizing objects and sounds, and learning through experience. Um, so we could say that artificial intelligence in general terms can be divided into two um, different um, aspects. One is the general AI that actually doesn't exist yet, because the general AI is when AI supposedly will get the same intelligence or capabilities than human intelligence or superior. This is a big debate, uh, and maybe we can talk uh, later a little bit about it. But we actually are now in narrow artificial intelligence because it's the artificial intelligence that dedicates to specific tasks. Maybe it could be an algorithm that has a specific function, but it could have also a lot of different functions. But for sure, we are not at the point in history or technological history where artificial intelligence achieve the same intelligence than humans. We actually uh, noted some points for, uh, from Joe Jones that uh, he's the creator of, of the Roomba uh, robot that we, some of us know, uh, that's uh, the cleaning robot. Um, and he says that we don't have to fear the robot because the process of creating a new technology um, is, is slow and it's very demanding because uh, robot success is opportunistic. Not every application has a viable robotic solution. Or in the state of the art means only select application offer, um, a large market, uh, existing technology that supports autonomy. So a robotic approach that outcompletes the other solutions. It's not just uh, create a solution or a robotic solution for every, uh, every problem or every application. So um, this, narrow artificial intelligence is in everything we know, uh, but it, the development of some, something bigger or something more related to general uh, artificial intelligence is, is very difficult right now. So um, we could understand that singularity in, in, or the idea of a general artificial intelligence is not near uh, in, in the future. Yes, maybe I, uh, to that, um, for me, it's a really interesting debate because it involves philosoph a, ph a philosophical debate, an ethical debate. And actually to, to get to the singularity, which is this point where artificial intelligence gets the same or um, a superior intelligence of, of humans or animals means that there are proper um, elements to human beings, for instance, common sense, embodiment, I mean, being a body, or having a multisensory body. Um, other things like perception and understanding of the context uh, requires a lot of technical um, development, ethical, and as I said, also social and philosophical. So we are a bit far, I would say, to achieve um, general artificial intelligence, but there are some ongoing discussions actually at the MIT, uh, and you can read it in a book called Singularity, actually. Um, it's a pocket book that says that maybe it will be achieved not in a exactly same way uh, that we think of uh, the intelligence of humans, but maybe creating digital environments and digital bodies um, with digital thinking. So it's something like 
a second life, um, this um, immersive game that we used to know at the beginning of the 2000s, but in a much more uh, developed way. Let's go to anyone. I just wanted to add that and that's what you're saying uh, is very relevant for the social sciences because it, it uh, uh, puts relevance in the context and that's where we are currently focusing our research uh, or the importance in or uh, on the importance of the context for the development of of new technologies and how they apply to our our daily lives. So that's how or what we, we are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, here there is, um, there is a cover of a newspaper because there is to um, be, it was at, at mid-century, um, a radio theater play that cheat all a whole nation in terms of it was so realistic that the people who uh, were hearing the, the radio program uh, thought that the extraterrestrial were invading Earth. It was a, a theater play about the war of worlds. And for those who study communication, um, it's very common to study the different models of communications. And I will say that one of the first models, even if it was not scientific, was the one so, uh, called the hypodermic needle or the magic bullet. This model stated that news or messages go straight to audiences, to massive audiences, and the audiences react passively, like right away, according to what the message says. So after this model, there, was a, there were a lot of um, scientific studies of models of communication that says, hey, humans are not so passive. We have critical capacities. Um, so we don't react right away uh, from what social media says, for instance, or from what we read on social media. Um, well, now it's social media, but in that, in that times were like uh, traditional newspapers, for instance, or radio. But if we think of social media, now there is a big discourse on misinformation, which is a a total reality because we have uh, this uh, concept called filter bubble, which it, it was coined by Eli Pariser, that says that um, the algorithms are shaping what kind of information you are receiving. In, for instance, in social networks, for instance, in search platforms such as Google search. And this has a lot of implication for freedom of expression, for plurality of content, but there is also this uh, thought uh, that states that people are reacting passively again to what the algorithms want us to read. So there is a big debate because it's like going back to the hypodermic needle theory, but I think it's a bit more complex. Of course, algorithms those algorithms, for instance, that are behind the social networks, that personalize content for us according to what we read, what we like, what we share, actually according to our full digital uh, footprint, of course it shapes our worldview, our behavior in some aspects, but we have to take in mind that it's always multidimensional. It's not, it's not just that algorithms are shaping us like if we were totally puppets, but it's important to understand critically the way they work um, just to have more freedom of decision. I, I wanted to add in that sense that Pariser also mentions, and I find it very interesting, that he mentions the responsibility of platforms and companies in that shaping of our world because uh, companies and algorithms make decisions based not just on what we share or what we are paying attention to but also um, from what where we are so uh, algorithm and platforms um, are, are shaping our world defining us uh, or because of these characteristics that we are not always aware of or we are not always 
thinking about. So I find it interesting because it's not, not just responsibility of the user that is sharing some information about uh, themselves, but also uh, from the companies that shape uh, specific content or specific interest due to our or, or, or where we are in the world, not just uh, about what we are willingly sharing. So uh, I find it very interesting because it allows us to, to think about how the algorithm are designed, uh, implemented and, 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 and can be evaluated. And that's also important for the second part of our, our talk. Yes, in this, um, regarding this, we have to think that, um, algorithmic agents that actually I, we can, for instance, for those who are not into cybernetics or computer, when we talk about algorithmic or algorithms, we think about a, a series of instructions that leads to a certain outcome. But when we connect algorithms with artificial intelligence, it's because they can predict, they can take more complex conclusions. And I think it's important to understand that this kind of dynamics um, or this, um, yes, the behavior of the algorithm, algorithms are introducing new dynamics that force us to rethink the existing models of communication. Consider, for example, that an algorithm is capable of receiving, emitting, analyzing, predicting also, and creating and generating information. If we read um, of if we explore the models of communication uh, from the Second World War to today, uh, in generally thought as a machine human, but in a way of how the message is produced and received by audiences, and also human human. But now we have this new entity, which is a algorithm or artificial intelligence agent that um, has all these capacities and we need to rethink maybe a new model of communication um, to better understand what are the dynamics in which artificial intelligence is embedded not only in communication but in all aspects of our lives. And also how transparent or opaque they are because uh, some of these algorithms are not visible to most people for for the public in general and maybe they are thinking that their searches or 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 the content they are looking for it's it's all they're doing or uh, the findings they have in in news or or any content they are looking for uh, they they think that the content they are get they are getting is all the content that the content there is, and they are not considering the part that algorithms play. So um, that's an important aspect in also the how we interact with social networks and other means of communication, but also how we are. Uh, thinking about media literacy, digital skills, and all those concepts that uh, are, are not only for adults, you know, just uh, for adults, but for children and youth also. So it's important to think about them as, as, um, as a way to, to understand the world. So it's important how we are learning that these uh, algorithms work. Great. Maybe we go to the next slide. Time is running really fast and we have a lot of things to talk about. Um, one of the, well, actually, one of the main things of this presentation is regarding to ethics, right? Um, because artificial intelligence has the potential and it's deeply nowadays impacting our lives and transforming our futures in so many different ways. So in this regard, Ethics must be transversal, and it has to be always at the center of any design, deployment, implementation, and use of AI technologies. Um, and this is something that we are really interesting into the research half of AI and society at the University of Chile, is that the 
you need an, an even access to an impact of AI-based technologies on marginalized populations run the risk of amplifying global digital inequalities. It's been a long time that we are talking about um, the digital gap and digital inequalities. And sometimes it thought that um, artificial intelligence, we don't reach yet to talk about this. But if you think that most of the digital platforms, spe especially social networks and search engines that are the ones who young people are using are based in artificial intelligence technologies. That means that, of course, we can talk about the digital divide on AI. So when we talk about um, marginalized populations, these groups may include urban, rural, poor communities, women, youth, for instance, LGBTIQ plus individuals or communities, uh, racial groups, physically challenged people, and particularly those people who are in the intersection of these identities. So um, there is a, a team that we are going to talk about in a few slides called Youth and Media that was one of the pioneers working on artificial intelligence and inclusion. Uh, and actually, we learned a lot from them all of the time. Uh, but maybe we can share uh, later on some recourses. So a complex set of issues exists at the intersection of artificial intelligence development and the application divide between what it's been said, the global north and the global south. Some of the thematic areas um, that for us, for instance, are really cross-cutting are health, education, well-being, humanitarian crisis uh, mitigation, as well as um, things like data infrastructure, law governance, and algorithms and design. So there are a lot of topics that involve and need the, the view, the exploration, the study from the social science and humanities, just to ensure that AI design development and implementation and use is actually ethic. Okay, let's go to the next one. These are some of the examples or some of the areas that we are uh, referring to uh, in regard to AI and ethics. We work on AI in education um, well, through uh, the, the construct of our database of what we are saying uh, in um, about data education or or education for data um, so as we said all the fields in which ai is embedded uh, and all kind of ai development and implementation need a human center or an ethical approach um, Sometimes technologies move faster than our possibilities or, or approaching or, or our capability of approaching them, them critically. Um, but we have to recognize that potential impacts and, and regulation um, on its design, implementation and, and use is very, very important. Many countries in the world um, are looking, are working on ethical frameworks for their national AI politics, being Chile one of them. And there are also regional and global frameworks that we are working on as well with. Um, okay, we can maybe see we can some see... examples. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the next slide, if you can, Anna. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so this was actually a, co a conference in Beijing that I had the privilege to assist. Um, it was a conference where it was uh, written and designed um, the consensus of artificial intelligence and education. So um, this uh, conference and the consensus was um, promoted, originated by UNESCO and the government of the Republic of China. Um, and it's the first ever document to offer 
some guidelines on how um, best to harness the potential of artificial intelligence technologies for achieving um, the objectives set out in the Education um, 2030 Agenda. So the consensus was adapted during the International Conference of Artificial Intelligence and Education, which was held, uh, as I said, in Beijing, and it included the participation of, uh, I think it was like 500 representatives from more than uh, 100 countries um, and 10 international organizations, um, among them UNESCO, UNICEF, ITU, etc. So um, we wanted to share this because this consensus explores how to promote AI in education, but from an ethical uh, and human-centered standpoint. Um, it's, well, the consensus is quite long, but it includes planning in education policies. It includes education management and delivery, teaching and uh, teacher empowerment also, because sometimes um, these technologies are um, um, difficult to access or difficult to, to be literate on how to use them. So there is learning assessment, the development of values and skills for lives. And this is a topic that is very important. And I will say that it's one of the biggest benefits, benefits of artificial intelligence in education, because it will allow if we prepare a, a really ethical um, framework or regulation to be able to access education for life. Um, this is in here, it's very important to work in a multi stakeholder holder level, not only universities, but also um, at, with the private sector, with NGO and with international organizations. So the purpose is promoting a, equitable and inclusive use of AI in education, involving gender equality, which is also very important and transversal to all the all the signs of artificial intelligence um, and ethical use of data in education, because we are dealing here uh, in some cases with data from children as well. So because uh, artificial intelligence in education to work well, it needs to monitor, to evaluate, to research on behavior. So what we are doing with this data is very important in terms of privacy, security, and well-being of the students, even if they are adults. So, one of the main um, one of the main challenges, or for all the states, is to develop and implement policies to promote the implementation or the integration of artificial intelligence in education. And here we have a huge gap because generally, artificial intelligence is more developed. Um, in, in countries from the uh, global north and also, of course, in China. But for instance, in Latin America, we still have a long way uh, to go. But this is, it has one advantage because the, these technologies are not totally implemented um, in Latin America. We still have the time to think about it critically, to think about what are the possible impacts that these technologies may have in our society. That's why uh, here in the so-called Global South, it's very important this space, this time that we have to really think about on ethical and social concerns. Maybe I can share with you some highlights of the consensus. They are that the consensus affirm that AI platforms and database uh, learning analytics should be adopted as key technologies in building integrated lifelong learning systems to enable personalized learning anytime, anywhere, and potentially for anyone. It reinforces the need to ensure that AI promotes uh, high quality education and learning opportunities for all irrespective of gender, disability, or social or economic status, ethnic or cultural background, or geographical uh, geographic location, 
and it also calls on efforts to support forward-looking reviews of frontier issues related to the implications of emerging AI development and facilitate the exploration of effective strategies and practices for using AI to innovate in, um, in, 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 in education with a view to building an international community with common views on artificial intelligence and education. What we're going to show you uh, now is um, a center that we actually work with from the beginning when we opened, the, when we created actually um, the research hub on artificial intelligence and society. Um, let's see, Anna, if we can move to the new slide. Um, and this center is called, yeah, uh, the project is called Youth and Media. It belongs to the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. And we work really in close collaboration with them. It's a, a team led by our colleague and friend, Sandra Cortesi, that she has also participated lastly in, uh, in many talks here in Chile, and of course internationally. But what is interesting about this center is that they uh, approach all possible different areas of the digital life of uh, youth. So they work on the intersection of youth and digital technologies. And as I just said, when we talk about digital technologies, today it's really difficult to think about digital technologies that don't use at all um, artificial intelligence, especially if we think about the daily practices of youth with technologies, which involves social networks and gaming, for instance. So this uh, team is one of the global reference uh, on the study of this intersection of youth and technologies. They have done a lot of research and application in different areas, such as, as you can see here in the, in the presentation, digital literacy, access, civic participation, youth well-being. So we encourage to explore their platform because all of the topics that they were are intervening with artificial intelligence, even though, as you can see, there is a, a specific area of artificial intelligence where you can um, dwell and explore more topics. So one of the um, articles that I really recommend, because one of the focus of our research here in the, in the research hub is um, youth, actually, um, and how youth relate with artificial intelligence. So there is this article, which is open access, and it's called Youth and Artificial Intelligence, Where We Stand. It's made by Alexa Hassi, Sandra Cortesi, Andres Lombana. All of them are working together with us in different projects, or we are working with them as well. Um, so I really highly recommend to, to explore this. One of the most important things that I find very, very useful is that in the field of artificial intelligence and, society, and, and social sciences and social society in general, is that uh, we are challenged by the task of defining our ground or where we stand. And the, the Youth and Media Project uh, of the Bergman Klein Center uh, really makes it easier <laughs> in that way because uh, they have specific, well, the websites and, and the general projects are al always uh, go, like orbiting these, uh, these definitions and they are all published on um, public in the web. So um, it's, it's nice for me to share it with you because it it gives us a common ground to start talking and, and discussing the topics. There was one uh, question in the chat that yes. was what the, the lines in the squares refer to is just the design. Every square has colors and lines. It's just a design for, it's a print screen from the website of Youth and Media. So it doesn't have a special meaning. Um, it's only aesthetics. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, well, we're moving forward to, to some more practical, 
practical experiences, but it's uh, nice here to see this map of inclusion of children's issues in national AI strategies. It's uh, from UNESCO. Um, the link is here, we can share it. Uh, maybe you have it, Leo, in our notes. Um, but the, the most important thing is that they are referred to four main issues and they evaluate uh, over 20 national strategies. And they um, came to the conclusion that a very few, very few of these strategies really mention in detail what AI means for children and their rights. So, um, you can interact with this visual, this visual uh, in the link, but um, but the, the most important thing is that there are some countries that are, are working on addressing children's issues in the national strategies, like Colombia and also Chile has as well uh, some young people participating on the national strategies um, writing. So. Um, you can interact with this, uh, and we are sharing the link right away. Okay, thank you, Anna. Oh. Maybe, um, oh, the presentation. Oh, moved away. here, <laughs> okay. because here you have the, um, oh, there's the review, but somewhere here is the, the um, interactive visualization, so you can. Maybe we can share the link in the chat. Yes. In, in the next minutes. No problem. Um, okay. okay. And also, here's one of the activities. I don't want to run out of time, but um, as, as Leonel was mentioning earlier, uh, there are some work from the international organizations to provide policy guidance for, for on AI for children or regarding children's rights. And this is a workshop that uh, took place on Sao Paulo last year for UNICEF, Latin American and the Caribbean. Um, it was hosted by, by CETIC in Brazil. And we worked on a methodological approach that was participa participative. And we wanted to share it with you because we, it, it uh, like the, it wasn't big as the Beijing consensus on artificial intelligence and education, but it um, allowed uh, um, social organizations, government representatives, and international organization representatives uh, to work together to to think about barriers and so possible solutions. Um, about AI and specifically for the rights of children. So um, it and it gives us the next yes the next slide that is the policy guidance on AI for children that was uh, the first draft draft uh, launched on September last se September this year. Yes, um, thank you, Anna. So I think this is really important because if uh, the first uh, policy guidelines made by UNICEF and multiple stakeholders, um, that the objective is that government corporations um, and UN also UN agencies um, are development, developing processes that seek to consult children and young people to inform and uh, refine the guidelines. So it's not an adultocentric perspective, um, but actually all the children were consulted and um, we did a lot of activities. Actually here in Chile, uh, we, per we implemented um, one of these activities, which was a workshop online uh, to actually, uh, the methodology is called deep listening. And it's not about going with uh, previous ideas, made by adults, but actually listening young people to understand what they think about artificial intelligence, what do they think they are, uh, their concerns, the opportunities that artificial intelligence can give to their lives. Um, and we were actually, um, it was quite impressive the, the amount of interest that these workshops um, showed. Um, and we, are, we already can also share the report because we did 
the four sessions with, I think, more than 153 children. Um, and I will say that the objective was first to understand uh, how children and young people already interact with artificial intelligence in their lives, to understand the risks and, and opportunities associated with AI, but also their rights and well-being. And this is why it's important to approach, um, to have a critical approach of AI from an ethical standpoint, and also to explore the, their views and actions that need to be taken uh, in order to maximize the benefit, maximize the benefits and limit the risks of AI systems in children. So maybe in the next slide, uh, I think we have the exactly, this is the cover of the report that we led with Ana Maria and together with UNICEF Chile, also the Ministry of Science. The, um, the, the Ministry of Science has a team called Equipo Futuro that help us also to implement this workshop and a program, national program called Explora. Um, this workshop has the participation of children from all around Chile, from north to south, um, and the interesting things, because we did it here as this same way through Zoom, but we also uh, activate breakout rooms so we can work in groups with them talking about different topics. So we could reach a lot of, I would say, a, a big range of, of themes and topics that will actually serve these guidelines or contribute to these guidelines that uh, it will be published soon the, the final version. What I found, found most interesting is that we worked uh, through case studies. Uh, so uh, in all groups, we could uh, find ourselves in front of, of very real cases or cases that youth could relate to. So it was very interesting, the discussion that uh, took part in this, in these groups. Okay, One we have really a few minutes, actually, yes. sorry, because, uh, and, and a lot of slides, this always happens because we want to tell a lot of stories, but uh, timing is always a bit complex. Um, one of the things um, that it was interesting that most of the children, they, they actually knew that um, artificial intelligence has a lot of capa capabilities and they can use it in a lot of different areas of their lives. Um, and for instance, all of them, they say that it, it helps us to do many tasks faster and easier. Actually, most of them, they found the, the, the main benefit of artificial intelligence is to make life easier. Um, and it ha can help um, to solve big problems like climate change. It can uh, help government to deliver better services and all of this, which means this and more, more kind of tasks. I wanted to address uh, the very interesting question of Joao uh, in the chat. He was asking, what do you think about AI shaping children's preferences? And it's uh, something we don't address here in the presentation, but I wanted to highly recommend the uh, article from Pedro Hartung for UNICEF because he uh, addresses this topic in his paper um, talking about the relevance of, of making um, AI and, and algorithms mostly uh, available for, understand, for the understanding of, of children and their families, because it, it has an impact. Uh, it has an impact on how we shape our world and also uh, on on what we think about the future, our possibilities and our opportunities. Um, meaning that uh, maybe something is, is uh, not sh being shown to us because we are uh, just thinking about the possibilities and, and that the algorithms send to us. So uh, it's very, very important what you are asking and we insist on you uh, reading the, the article of Pedro. Thank you. Maybe we pass uh, to the next slide. Yes. Um, and also there are some questions, but maybe we um, 
maybe we finish the presentation and then if we have some minutes, we can answer yes. a, a few questions. Um, one of the main questions that, uh, or, or the topics that was most inter interesting for children was that if AI has conscious. Um, and that was quite fantastic because for most of them, uh, AI doesn't have consciousness. And we, we said, you're right, it doesn't have consciousness. But some of them, the ones who said, I think artificial intelligence has consciousness. Um, and we say, well, why? Uh, because we, we haven't achieved that yet. And the children were saying, well, listen, if you adults are not able to define what human consciousness is, why are you saying that artificial intelligence doesn't have any conscious? So it was interesting because, of course, it involves a philosophical and ethical debate. And as you can see, children has a lot of a lot to say uh, to adults, and we can learn a lot from them. So maybe, I'm sorry, but we move forward to the next slide so we can... Um, yes, here is the article that I share on the chat. Yes, we will move forward. We wanted to, to show you some of the main methodological approaches to deal with AI, specifically with uh, children in this case. Um, this is from Responsible Data for Children. Uh, it's a matrix that allows us to, to question the decision provenance mapping worksheet. And we have here uh, all the par parts of the development of an artificial intelligence and all the questions that we should ask these uh, stages. So this methodology is relevant for us uh, because we can ask all the uh, every stage of of the decision provenance um, for the from the initiation and how was the data investment designed and instigated to the use how how um, is the data ultimately put to use so we it's the kind of methodology that UNICEF uh, is using and we are also uh, using in our research. Um, these are some of the aspects that the methodology can, uh, can not this methodology, but the same methodology about questions on the stages and the stakeholders that are provided by the article, uh, Matching Behavior Published by Nature. Um, it's for, from several authors, but the first one is Iyar Ranam. Um, so you can find it online also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we are talking about kinetics, democracy, and um, algorithm, society, and also, oh, the last one was kinetic also. Yes. Yes. Um, and maybe before we move to, to this one, Anna, sorry, um, just to, to give a, a short framework of what we just have uh, shown on the presentation. Maybe the prior slide, if you can move um, back again. Um, the question, for instance, in society, uh, we can think of, um, for instance, in, in this case, it, the article talks about online dating. And we could ask questions, for instance, does the matching algorithm use facial features? Because it has implications for privacy and security. So does the matching algorithm amplify or reduce homophily? Um, the home assistants, uh, or they are also called conversational robots. We could ask, does the robot promote products to children? Because it has ethical implication. Does the algorithm affect collective behaviors? Or there was a case in the US that was very famous where uh, little kids or children from kindergarten, they were talking to peers, to classmates, as they used to talk with home assistants without asking for, uh, like, uh, without kindness, actually. Instead of saying, uh, please, could you give me this information? They just say, give me this information, because it's the way these home assistants and are trained to interact with. Uh, that has some kind of values that are missing uh, and that, that we actually need to practice in our daily interaction with humans. So I think they are moving forward to, 
correct this kind of uh, parameters in order so in order to ask these uh, robots for information you have to be uh, more kind now um, but this is not applied in all of the system yet because the problem here was that the children were really talking with rude manners not in a good way with their peers and it was because they are using all the time home assistants at their homes thank you anna okay here is a, an amazing project that is uh, we are running it now uh, and working on it uh, we are doing it together with the national uh, it's funded by the national research council of norway and we are doing it with the uh, business uh, economic school from oslo um, it's a big project, European project, that it's led by Christian Fiesler, and we are doing the Chilean chapter, and it has a lot of implication on how algorithms shape our lives in some ways. And in, the, in this case, we are working, um, the project is called Future Ways of Working in the Digital Economy, and um, we are working in what it's called platform economy specifically those delivery platforms. Do you know this uh, platform where you can ask for food to your home and somebody comes in a bicycle? Well, what happens in the life of the workers uh, is actually highly shaped by algorithms because algorithms tell them where to go in the city, where they can't go. Algorithms are giving them uh, the application, it's sending them all the time alarms and sounds on how they should react, if they should move faster, or if they have only a few minutes to deliver the food to their homes. Um, and actually there are a lot of invisible questions or invis invisible dynamics and things that we generally don't hear or don't see. So what we are doing is working well we did actually focus group we did a, a cyber ethnographic study in facebook group from delivery workers but also we are collecting whatsapp audios audio files um, where workers specifically women and non-binary workers are telling us their stories the vulnerabilities things that happens during their work and it's a way of understanding these dynamics that never, um, in general, they never show uh, in media or, yes, in, in, in mainstream media. So uh, what we try to do is understanding how algorithms shape their life of the workers, but on the other hand, giving the workers a voice to talk about things that are uh, generally invisible to us. And then it has like a, a specific artistic part because we are using an algorithm to convert the audio files into music. Um, and through music, you can feel the mood and the feelings of the workers. Um, so it's a very interesting project that we are actually presenting this Thursday in a cultural uh, festival for the, from the government of Colombia, but we expect to have the final results um, on from December to March. Cool. Thank you, Anna. Lionel and Professor Castillo, we have some questions on the chat. Would you have, do you have some minutes now to answer or? Yes, let's or, go to the questions. Yes, because I know you have to leave at 10 because you have some interviews. Yes. So no first, uh, Bayang asks, AA is widely used in education in China recently especially in K-12 after school training. Subjects range from English learning to art and piano. AI helps, helps re to reduce costs and more families could afford. Is the circumstances the same in Chile? That's I would say, yes. Um, I would say no. We don't have uh, widely uh, used AI for education. We have some experiences, but they are not, um, uh, they are they are not very common, and they uh, actually uh, they are for they are not uh, affordable for all families. Mm -hmm. So it would be a main difference because every innovation or technological innovation requires um, 
yes, requires the implementation and technological resources that not every family has have. So uh, I would say no to, <laughs> to as an answer. Yes, maybe to adapt what Anna just said, in Chile, there are some initiatives that are very important in terms of, for instance, uh, language, uh, using artificial intelligence tutors for learning English, for instance, and even other uh, subjects in basic and uh, 2K schools. Um, but as Anna mentioned, families in general, they don't have a lot of resources, but also schools, no? Or there is not yet um, a government uh, politics to implement uh, wide across the country artificial intelligence systems in education like it is nowadays. And we know, and I could visit some schools in Beijing when I went there, and it's quite impressive uh, in Chile. So uh, there is, for instance, one initiative uh, that use, is called Brainy, that use IBM algorithms um, to create personalized pathways for education in Chile. And it's now, I think, implemented in 20 schools in Santiago, but it's, I'm not talking about the whole country itself. So I think we are a long way, but uh, this is starting for me. Um, and regarding the question that you can see on the screen, why social sciences and humanities are important for AI, if we think of implementing AI system in education in Chile or in any country, we have to think always that on the importance of humans, the importance of professors, of teachers. There has to be always a human behind these uh, algorithms because we delegate a lot of decisional powers to algorithms but it's always good to have humans behind them to audit if they are ethically uh, predicting, working, suggesting, um, make, generating outputs to children and to society in general. So uh, as Anna rightly said, the question is, is not the same in Chile at all, but we are in the way. And we have some time to think critically about it before implementing it. So it's a good thing. Yeah. Thank you for Thank the question. You. Thank you. Let's go in 30 to... seconds, I would try to in 30 seconds, I would try to address the issue on privacy. I was actually uh, preparing a presentation for tomorrow's workshop at the Bergman Klein Center um, for Internet and Society. And we have some things to say about privacy. Uh, we can say, for example, that um, young people are are very worried uh, about their privacy and they are aware of the risks that artificial intelligence um, can can bring to them and they, they find a disconnection between the information they have or the information they'd like to acquire on privacy from the information that adults and schools and parents can provide so that would be main uh, main thought about privacy here in Chile. It is interesting because children in general, they said that um, they, at least here in Chile, they don't want parents to be really close to them uh, when they interact with digital technologies or AI systems. But actually the, the, the ones who children identify as responsible if anything goes wrong are parents. So there is a big need of parents' literacy as, as well. Uh, and that involves uh, big efforts from not only governments, but NGO, universities, and all multiple stakeholders that are interested in this field. Thank you. Do you have minutes I for think the last question? With, with the questions. Um, there are yes, a few probably, more. Yes. So thank yes. you so much. I hope you have enjoyed this webinar. Uh, and, Ana Maria and I are really available. If you want to contact us, um, you can access our email through the university web. Um, and we, of course, we are really happy to collaborate uh, with any question or initiative you may think you could have. Thank you so much. And thank you um, for having us, Eduardo Vera and the team from uh, International Relations at the University of Chile. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Castillo and Professor Brossi. Uh, and I hope the students enjoyed this presentation. Remember that tomorrow we have the second webinar of the week, Latin American politics. So be sure to register and enjoy 
uh, our presentation tomorrow and on, on Wednesday as well. So um, I know Professor Garcia and Professor Brosi have to leave. So thank you so much again. And uh, we finalize our webinar for today. Thank you everyone who was present. Thank, thank you. you. Anna and Lionel, it's, a, it's been an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for the invitation. Bye bye. Take care.